All right. Well, it's 801. We want to get everyone back to their jobs after this. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is Friday, March 18th, I believe. Um, and we have, I believe for the first time, um, Dr. Shannon Balcom, who is going to present to us on um, the CROI 20, 2022 um, uh, review of HIV therapeutics. Um, so for those who don't know Shannon, and I think most people do at this point, um, she is a pharmacist. Uh, Shannon Malcolm is a pharmacist for the inpatient HIV medicine team uh, at UCSD. She joined the ON team in 2014 as part of the Transitions of Care Pharmacist Program. She completed her PharmD at Northeastern University in Boston in 2008, and then her PGY1 in acute care pharmacy at UC San Diego Health and, UC, and PGY2 in critical care pharmacy at University of Washington. Um, she worked as a staff pharmacist in the inpatient pharmacy team on the La Jolla campus for several years before joining the HIV team in her current role. Uh, as the inpatient HIV pharmacist, she has the privilege of assisting with medication therapy management and transitions of care of all individuals admitted to UCSD with HIV. She's also an assistant clinical professor at SCAGS and a certified HIV pharmacist specialist. She also helps with the um, with the cardiology discharges as well. So she she has a dual role that sometimes we forget about, but it's cool to see her doing both things. So anyway, with that, um, Shannon's going to take us through a little journey of uh, of HIV therapeutics, what was new, and some interesting studies from CROI. Take it away, Shannon. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity. So I have nothing to disclose other than I tried to make it a little fun by um, utilizing an analogy of the Madrigal family from the new Disney movie Encanto. The Madrigal family is gifted with magical powers for good, albeit somewhat dysfunctional at times. So we will be the character of Abuela, the matriarch of the Madrigal family, who values the gifts each family member brings um, and helps them to realize their full potential in the community they serve. So we're gonna kind of do a rapid fire review of um, quite a few studies from CROI. So we'll, we'll first review two broadly neutralizing antibody studies, three long acting injectable studies and four switch studies. So diving right into it, um, I chose the character of Louisa to represent uh, B nabs because uh, Louisa has superhuman strength. So uh, uh, B nabs are powerful antibodies like Louisa that can work against different strains of HIV, blocking HIV entry into healthy cells and activating other immune cells to help destroy infected cells. Um, we'll review one article on triple B nab therapy and one on dual long acting B nab therapy. So, first, we'll review viral escape during triple B nab uh, therapy against HIV. So a little bit of background, um, we know HIV B nabs can robustly reduce plasmaviremia in persons not on antiretrovirals um, and can moderately delay viral rebound in individuals during treatment interruptions. Um, however, unfortunately, rapid selection of neutralization resistant virus um, has been observed with mono and also dual therapy. Um, so authors hypothesize that we may need at least three B nabs um, for robust suppression of viremia. So they combined uh, three BNABs, PGDM1400, which targets the V2 apex, PGD, uh, PGT121, which targets the V3 glycan, and VRCO7523LS, which targets the CD4 binding site. Authors define this as an exquisitely broad cocktail. The first portion of the study was pharmacokinetics for PGDM1400. The second portion was the open label uh, portion assessing antiviral activity of a single infusion of 20 mg per kg of each BNAB in viremic individuals. They were all HIV subtype B. So um, here authors show uh, virologic response to the single infusion. So, oh, actually. You guys see my laser pointer. Um, so uh, here's the, we have the BNAB infusion here. They all had virologic response with an average log reduction of 1.7 by day seven. Uh, one participant was lost, was lost to follow up before rebound. The other three participants had rebound at a median of 20 days postnatal with a range of 13 to 70 days as shown here. Um, 
authors conducted uh, virologic susceptibility testing at baseline and at time of rebound. Um, this was evaluated by pseudoviruses generated by a single HIV envelope sequence and TZMBL neutralization assays. So for the first participant um, who had virologic response and pretty quick rebound, um, they were found to have baseline uh, partial resistance to PGD-121, and then at time of rebound had resistance to both PGDM-1400 and PGT-121, um, but maintained um, susceptibility to VRCO7523 LS um, at baseline and at time of rebound. The second participant was actually found to have resistance to PGDM-1400 and PGT-121 at baseline, um, and at time of rebound had maintain susceptibility again, uh, like the previous participant to VRCO7523 LS. Um, and the third participant that had uh, sustained virologic suppression actually was susceptible to all three at baseline and then had partial susceptibility to PGM1400 and PGT121 at time of rebound um, and full susceptibility still to VRCO7523 LS uh, rebound. So in conclusion, PGM-1400 alone or in combination was safe and well tolerated. The half-life was about 21 days and 11 days in viremic participants. Um, in terms of efficacy of the triple, triple cocktail, uh, all participants had virologic response with a mean drop um, of two logs at viral nadir. Nadir occurred at about 10 days and rebound occurred between day 13 and 70 post nadir. Um, unfortunately, there was selection of partially or completely resistant viral variants to PGDM1400 and PGT121, uh, but rebound viruses maintain susceptibility to VRCO7523 LS. Interestingly, um, rebound did occur in the presence of pretty high um, levels of VRCO7523 LS, um, which uh, was consistent with other BNAB studies as well. Um, and this suggests that there may, it, we may need to have a fine balance of broad antiviral activity and also potentially higher BNAB concentrations um, in vivo in order to achieve virologic control. Uh, the next BNAB study was a phase one study of long acting 3BNC117 and 101074 in viremic adults. Um, 3BNC117 targets the CD4 binding site and 101074 targets the V3 glycan. Um, so the LS variants of these uh, MABs enhance the FCRN binding and prolong half life So for 101074, you can see this is the um, uh, non-LS variant, and then the LS variant half-life was prolonged up to 80 days. Um, same with the BNC117, the uh, half-life was prolonged up to 62 days. Um, authors conducted some PK modeling to try to estimate um, how long virologic suppression may occur, and they thought they would potentially have prolonged virologic suppression potentially out to the one year mark after a single infusion. So this was a phase one open label single arm study to evaluate the safety and PK and antiviral activity of this combination. Participants received a single infusion of 30 mg per kg each um, and followed up at 24 weeks. Um, there were six participants. The virologic response is uh, the black line. So, um, all participants, again, had a virologic response with a mean log reduction of 1.9. The first four participants had pretty transient drops and then uh, rebound. And then um, these last two participants, who actually had relatively low viral loads at baseline, did maintain virologic suppression um, for, for prolonged periods. This participant rebounded at 36 weeks. This participant rebounded at about six, uh, 20 weeks. So authors did conduct... Um, sensitivity testing only at baseline with the Phenosense assay. The first four participants that had relatively quick viral rebound were actually found to have resistance to one or the other BNAB. So these two participants were resistant to 101074, and these two participants were resistant to 3BNC117. Um, the two participants that had low lower viral loads at baseline and uh, sustained virologic response were both found to have susceptibility by Phenosense at baseline. So authors concluded that uh, this combination did maintain in vivo antiviral activity. Um, as expected, the half-lives were prolonged with the LS uh, variants. Antibody DK was faster during ongoing viremia and compared to participants that are um, already suppressed, which is consistent with other BNAB studies. Um, and so finally, in this small pilot study, participants with double BNAB sensitivity of circulating virus, as demonstrated by the Phenosense assay, did show greater and longer antiviral responses. So I'll take a pause now to see if there's any questions about the BNAB studies. So far, nothing in the chat. Okay, 
moving right along. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it got a lot to get through. Um, so in for long acting injectable lenacapavir, I chose the character of Mirabelle. She is the only child in her family that hasn't quite figured out her power yet, but um, there, she, there's something very special about her and she will definitely change the future of her family for the better. Um, so first we'll review uh, the Capella study, which was long acting lenacapavir in multi-drug resistant HIV with a 52 week result. Um, just as a quick review, lenacapavir is a long acting potent inhibitor of the HIV-1 capsid protein with in vitro activity against viral strains resistant to other ARB classes. Uh, by targeting HIV capsid, lenacapavir actually interferes with multiple early and late stage processes of the viral life cycle. So capsid disassembly, nuclear transport, viral production, and capsid assembly. Um, so like uh, some of the other MDR studies, the design was a little bit complicated. So um, uh, participants had to have a viral load of greater than 400 copies. They had to be resistant for, to at least two agents from three of the four main ARV classes. Um, they had to have less than or equal to two fully active agents from the four main ARV classes. Um, they had an additional viral load checked at time of actual randomization, and if their viral load had then declined by more than a half a log, or they were now less than 400, they were immediately placed in the non-randomized cohort. Um, if they still met virologic criteria, then they were randomized to either um, two weeks of oral lenacapavir lead-in with continuation of their failing regimen or placebo with their failing regimen. Um, the virologic suppression data was already presented for uh, this point, um, but just as a refresher, nearly 90% of participants who received lenacapavir in the first two weeks had at least a half a log reduction in HIV RNA compared to only 17% in the placebo group. So after the initial two weeks, participants um, in the oral LEN group were uh, transitioned to subcutaneous LEN Q6 months for 52 weeks with an optimized background regimen or OBR. The placebo group had oral lead-in followed by subcutaneous LEN with OBR as well. And the non-randomized cohort just immediately started um, the regimen. So efficacy for the randomized cohort was previously presented at week 26. Um, this new data at week 52 does show um, that urologic suppression was maintained at very high rates out to week 52. Um, interestingly, uh, as the number of fully active agents in the optimized background regimen increased, so did virologic response with 94% uh, um, uh, suppression in participants with at least two fully active uh, agents. Um, however, impressively, even the participants that had zero expected active agents in their background regimen, uh, two out of three had virologic um, suppression at the one year mark. So pretty impressive there. Um, Lenacapavir resistance was observed in eight participants, four of which had no fully active drugs in the OBR, and four had um, objective evidence of non-adherence to the OBR. Uh, mutations are listed here, the most common being the M66I. Um, diarrhea and nausea were the most common adverse events with lenacapavir, um, and there were 29% uh, of participants had grade three or four lab abnormalities, um, primarily being low creatinine clearance or elevated creatinine, glucosuria, and non-fasting hyperglycemia. Authors deemed these to be not clinically relevant. They stated that the low creatinine clearances and elevated creatinine were transient and, or unconfirmed. Um, hyperglycemia as well was transient, unconfirmed, or related to underlying diabetes. Um, injection site reactions did occur, but they were mostly grade one or two. Um, there were no grade four ISRs. Two participants had grade three, one with um, swelling and erythema, which resolved relatively quickly. Um, and then one participant with pain, which resolved in one day. Um, all the nodules were grade one, except for one participant. Um, and the nodules were presumed to be granulomatous reactions. Um, many resolved, they were not painful, they were not visible, but they were palpable. I'm only one participant discontinued study drug. Um, due to injection site reaction for a grade one nodule. Um, so in conclusion, in highly treatment experience, uh, people with HIV and limit, with limited treatment options um, due to MDR, lenacapavir in combination with an OBR led to high rates of virologic suppression. Um, it was well tolerated and there was only one discontinuation due to injection site reactions. So next we'll review lenacapavir as part of a combination regimen for treatment naive uh, patients. Shannon, can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. Um, just with a question from Nettie. She was curious about the nausea, diarrhea mm. um, side effects. Mm -hmm. And as she notes, two, two very dreaded um, 
uh, side effects for patients. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't know if there's more to that comment, Nettie. Yeah, and the authors didn't really elaborate on level of severity necessarily for those, unfortunately. Oh, they didn't talk about the grades, huh? Oh, uh, but none of them were grade three or four. So it was either grade one or grade two. Based on what uh, you wrote. Well, lab way. abnormality. Uh, oh, lab, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know what, I could look back. Okay. I don't recall if they said what the grades were for these, but I don't think yeah. it was on the slide. Yeah, yeah great point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Okay. And then, so yeah, so in treatment naive participants, so um, so Calibrate is the phase two study um, in treatment naive individuals. Um, they had to have a viral load of greater than 200 and a CD4 count greater than 200. They were randomized in a two to two to two to one open label fashion. Um, a little tricky uh, design. So treatment group one and two both received oral lead-in followed by Q6 month subcutaneous LEN with uh, daily FTAF for the first 28 weeks. If they were virologically suppressed at week 16 and 22, then they dropped the m tricytabine and they continued subcutaneous line with TAF in group one or subcutaneous line with bactegravir in group two. Group three was oral LEN and F-TAF daily. Um, and treatment group four was BF-TAF daily. Um, of note, 15% of the cohort had a baseline viral load of greater than 100,000 copies. So efficacy at week 54 was very good in all four groups. Um, in the pooled subcutaneous line of captivator group, so groups one and two, um, virologic suppression was maintained in 88% of participants. Virologic suppression rates were similar across the study groups as well um, and were achieved as early as four weeks um, in a lot of participants showing similar rapid viral suppression with LEN containing regimens similar to what we see with INSTE-based regimens. Um, due to phase two status, no formal statistical testing was conducted on any of this. Um, five participants met criteria for resistance testing in the LEN containing regimen, two of which were found to have LEN resistance. Um, both the authors suggested um, may have had non-adherence to the FTAF backbone. Um, one, because they developed the M184M slash I first prior to lenacapavir resistance and one due to pill count and drug levels and both uh, later suppressed on INSTE-based regimens. Um, in this lenacapavir study, headache and nausea were the most common adverse events, um, similar to the BF-TAF, maybe a little more nausea, um, and no discontinuations um, due to adverse events. Trying to look to see if they put grade. Yeah, so no grade four <laughs> in this one, at least they reported. Okay, and then um, in terms of injection site reactions, they did occur mostly grade one or two. Again, there was one grade three nodule after the second subcutaneous dose. Three participants did discontinue due to injection site reactions, um, two due to grade one in duration, one due to grade one erythema and swelling after the second dose. 25% um, of participants in the combined lenacapavir groups and uh, BF-TAF groups had grade three or four lab abnormalities, excuse me, low creatinine clearance and high creatinine kinase um, are shown there. Um, they were also deemed to be not clinically relevant and there were no discontinuations due to this. So authors concluded subcutaneous LEN initially in combination with oral FTAF um, and later with oral TAF or Bictegravir achieved and maintained virologic suppression through one year at very high rates. Um, the oral lenacapavir arm also had uh, similar efficacy. LEN was well tolerated and discontinuations due to adverse events were infrequent. Um, and this supports ongoing investigation of lenacapavir in this population. Um, any questions about lenacapavir? Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> so uh, something caught my eye from the 52 data in safety relative to hyperglycemia that the study showed that is transient, that it show hyperglycemia and show glycosuria. So in my clinical mind, there are two possible ways of glycosuria, dysfunctional proximal tubule, or when you saturate the TM with consistent hyperglycemia above 180 milligrams per deciliter for more than 12 weeks. So one way to sort that out, what is the mechanism, whether it's there, there is really a true effect with prolonged use, is to differentiate hemoglobin A1C between groups. Mm. And I wonder whether they present the data. They did not. They just said, you know, attributable to diabetes, but they didn't really elaborate on that, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you.
Okay. And then the other question was, you know, is, is, are the studies still on hold to which I said, yes. Yes. And they did uh, talk in about in the, um, in one of the discussion sessions that there was some optimism that they might have figured out a vial formulation that was going to be compatible and there might be forward movement, but it sounded like maybe just they, they, uh, they have a, they have um, a solution presented to the FDA right now with, um, oh, okay. yeah. with um, strip not straining. What's wrong with me? Uh, Filtering? Filter. Filtering. Thank you. <laughs> so sorry. I'm like, I'll get there. Uh, yeah, with filtering. Okay. Um, so I think that, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I believe so they I continued, is, yeah, and I believe they continued the oral, any studies that have oral LEN are still going. Yeah, going, yeah. for the so. studies that needed to, I think that was the, the switch for most of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. So moving on to long acting injectable cabotegravir piverine. Um, I chose Isabella to represent cabopivirine because Isabella is loved by everyone. Um, she's pretty much perfect with an abundance of grace and poise, but also she learns she doesn't have to be perfect after all. So we'll review um, the updates to Atlas 2M. So just a little bit of a reminder. So Atlas 2M is uh, essentially continuation um, from Atlas 1. So um, participants that uh, were in Atlas 1 in either arm um, were randomized for uh, Atlas 2M. So just as a reminder or fresher, Atlas 1 compared was essentially a switch study in well-controlled participants on three drug regimens who were randomized to either continue their uh, three drug oral regimen or transition to Q4 week cabropivirine. Um, at the end of that study, participants were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either Q4 week or Q8 week um, cabropivirine. If they were, they also added additional oral participants to the randomization. Um, so if participants were already on cabopivirine, they skipped the oral lead-in. Um, otherwise, they received oral lead-in followed by the Q8 week or Q4 week um, cabopivirine. So in terms of results, at 152 weeks, uh, virologic suppression was maintained in both the Q8 week and Q4 week at high rates by intention to treat and per protocol analysis. Um, not sure what's going on with these participants that don't have virologic data. It'd be interesting to see that. Not sure if they were lost to follow up, they didn't comment. Um, but at least in the participants we have data on, um, very good rates of virologic suppression out to three years. Um, unfortunately, there were two additional participants in the Q8 week arm who met criteria for virologic failure. Um, both were male at birth and both had a BMI less than 30. Neither of them were overdue for any of their injections by more than seven days. Um, at baseline, neither of them had resistance mutations. Um, one participant uh, with subtype A6 did have the L71 integrase polymorphism. Uh, the participant from Germany did develop ropivirine and INSTI resistance, as well as the participant from Russia. So in some total across the three years, there have now been 13 participants total with virologic failure. Um, 11 or 2% were in the Q8 week arm and two or 0.4% to be exact in the Q4 week arm. Um, I summarized all of the resistance um, mutations here. So in the Q8 week arm, there were 522 participants, 11 with virologic failure, nine developed resistance to ropivirine, listed here, and then um, seven developed INSTI resistance, which is listed here. Um, Q4 week arm, there are 523, so two participants, which uh, uh, comes out to 0.4%. One participant developed ropivirine resistance and both developed INSTI resistance. Um, in terms of um, Injection site reactions, they did occur. However, 99% of them were grade one or two. They were generally short-lived about three days with rare discontinuation due to injection site reactions. Um, in terms of satisfaction scores, um, so the mean satisfaction scores continued to increase across the entire study period. Um, and there was a significant, um, significantly higher um, patient satisfaction in the Q8 lead dosing arm. So in conclusion, cabopivirine injections given Q8 week, uh, Q8 weeks remained effective through 152 weeks when compared to the Q4 week administration. Virologic failure overall was very low um, with 2% in the Q8 week arm and 0.4% in the Q4 week arm. Treatment satisfaction increased significantly from baseline and significantly favored the Q8 week arms. Any questions about cabopivirine? Okay. We're good to go. <laughs> 
All right, and finally, we'll go over the switch studies. So to represent switch, I chose Camilo um, because Camilo's gift is shape-shifting, allowing him to change his appearance to be whatever he needs to be in the moment. So we'll review um, three switch studies to Dalyutegravir um, from Africa, VSEN, 2SD, and Nadia, and then some post-hoc um, genotype data from the SALSA study. So first we'll review uh, the VSEN study, which stands for Virologic Impact of Switching from a Favarins and Nivirapine-based ART to Dalyutegravir. Um, so participants um, were on NNRTI-based therapy. They uh, differentiated between participants who were well-controlled as defined by viral, viral load less than 1,000 copies or uh, failing therapy uh, with a viral load greater than 1,000 copies. For the suppressed participants, they were randomized to receive TLD, which stands for TDF, lamivudine, dalutegravir, or TAFID, which stands for TAF, entricitabine, dalutegravir. And for the failing participants, they were randomized to receive either TLD, TAFED, um, it's difficult to see, so I wrote it here, um, AZT3TC with uh, boosted lapinavir, or AZT3TC with boosted adizanavir, which was considered kind of their standard second line um, therapy in, Zom in Zambia. Um, primary endpoint is proportion of viral load less than 1,000 copies at 144 weeks. Um, this is the 48-week data. Um, so in terms of efficacy in the well-controlled switch patients, um, virologic suppression um, was achieved in uh, at equal rates uh, in the TLD and TAFED arms as shown, by, as shown here in intention to treat and per protocol. Um, I showed the less than 1,000 copies, um, but also at less than 50 copies, um, similar rates. Um, for the uh, arm B, which is the participants that were failing in an RTI therapy, um, virologic suppression is shown here. Um, looks like pretty similar rates uh, by intention to treat in per protocol for the TAFED, TLD, and AZT groups, um, but it appears that the lapinavir groups um, had lower rates of virologic suppression, particularly when we look at the viral loads less than 50 copies here. Um, weight gain is shown here. Sorry, it's a little busy slide. Um, this first uh, table is the well-controlled switch participants. So um, they all had weight gain, but there was significantly more in the TAFED group than TLD. For failing participants, um, there was a larger magnitude of weight gain, likely you know, some return to health status in this population would explain that. Um, TAFED and TLD did have higher rates of um, weight gain, but there was no difference between the two. Um, but then when they did subgroup analysis, they did find that women had higher rates of weight gain with TAFED, and men had higher rates of weight gain with TLD. So key findings from the VSEN study is that for uh, participants with baseline RNA less than 1,000 copies um, on NNRTI-based therapy, TAFED was not inferior to TLD, um, but it was associated with higher weight gain. Uh, for participants who were failing with a viral load greater than 1,000 copies, TAFED was also not inferior to TLD. Um, and then when they combined TAFED and TLD, they found it to be superior to the combination of both PI arms. TAFED was associated with higher weight gain in women, but less weight gain in men when compared to TLD. These results support the use of tenofovir, entricitabine, or lamivudine, and dolutegravir um, in patients switching from first-line in an RTI-based therapy, regardless of their uh, viral load status. Sorry, do you think you could show us the, I, I'm sorry, the weight was oh. really small and the, like, I couldn't tell how much weight gain that was for women. Yeah, so for women, it's, that's 5.7 kilos. So like, uh, what is that, 12, 13 pounds? That's a lot of pounds. <laughs> a lot, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, um, and, and, so, and the TLD, this is 4.6 in men. So yeah, what is that, like eight or nine pounds in men? So pretty significant. You know, like I said, these participants were failings and I think their baseline CD4 counts were in the 150 range and they did have slightly lower BMIs at baseline. Um, so, you know, definitely some return to health status contributing, um, but, but yeah, still pretty impressive. And even in the- Well, PS, that is, and that's impressive. such an important key, right? Yeah. The return to health, yeah. Like, at what? How much is that return to health? Right, um, right. Like in the, in the group person. that was right, like the pre group that was pre uh, previously well controlled, they saw the TLD only had what is this about two pounds of weight gain, and then TAFED was about five pounds. I mean, so it definitely yeah. still occurred, um, but to a lesser magnitude for sure. Um, 
Um, okay, so uh, moving on to the 2SD trial, which was switching treatment experience in a GRACE inhibitor naive neurologically suppressed participants from a ritonavir boosted PI to dolutegravir. Um, so this is a multi-center study at four sites in Kenya. They did no, prior, no assessment of prior antiretroviral um, drug resistance. They had to be um, well-controlled and uh, sustained on a PI-based regimen for 24 weeks um, and have no prior INSD experience. They're randomized in a one-to-one -one open label fashion to either continue their current uh, PI-based regimen or switch to dolutegravir with two NRTIs. Um, at baseline in Kenya, most participants were on a boosted adazanavir based regimen, about 25% or 20, 25% had uh, lopinavir. And then um, about 50% were on TDF 3TC uh, and 40% were on AZT 3TC for their NRTI backbone. Um, so high rates of neurologic suppression were um, achieved at week 48, um, above 90 in both uh, study arms with no difference there. Um, so authors concluded that switching from a boosted PI to dolutegravir may be an effective and safe strategy for treatment experienced virologically suppressed adults with no prior INSD exposure, even without knowledge of their prior resistance testing. Um, next, we'll review the NADIA study, which uh, stands for Nucleosides and Derinavir Dolutegravir in Africa trial. So a little bit of background on Nadia. So the WHO public health approach recommends for second line therapy uh, for persons who are failing a Favarin's based therapy to switch to dolutegravir and two NRTIs. They also recommend switching from TDF 3TC in their first line regimen to Zidovidine 3TC with no resistance testing for NRTI selection with a simplified monitoring um, regimen, sparse viral loads and safety testing. So Nadia aimed to test kind of two study questions. One, whether dolutegravir was not inferior to kind of best in class PI um, boosted darunavir in second line therapy in a population with a high rate of baseline um, NRTI resistance. And secondly, to, to test if TDF3TC is not inferior to zidovudine in second line therapy. Um, they already presented the, the 48 week results and dolutegravir at that point was shown to be non-inferior to darunavir. There was caution with four cases of dolutegravir resistance um, and TDF 3TC was found to be non-inferior to zidovudine 3TC. So like I said, participants were failing their NNRTI based regimens um, with the viral load greater than a thousand copies times two. Uh, participants were randomized in a two by two factorial design, which allowed for power to answer both study questions. So the first they were randomized to either dolutegravir or boosted darunavir, and then they were randomized again to TDF3TC or zidovudine3TC. Um, they conducted resistance testing in an open fashion when there was confirmed virologic rebound greater than 1,000 copies and in a closed fashion at baseline and for viral load rebound greater than 400. Um, there were about 500 participants from seven sites in Uganda, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. 61% were female, about half of them had CD4s less than 200, and 28% had viral loads greater than 100,000 copies. Um, there was 60% baseline tenofovir resistance, 18% zidovudine resistance, and 92% uh, 3TC resistance. They had very high rates of um, retention and uh, uh, adherence to study visits. So at 96 weeks, um, there was very high rates of virologic suppression with dolutegravir and darunavir, and there was no difference found between the two groups. Um, and this was maintained across different sensitivity analyses and viral load thresholds. Um, interestingly, uh, a viral rebound greater than 1,000 copies was also similar between the two groups. However, of note, um, seven participants in the dolutegravir group actually developed major dolutegravir resistance, whereas zero participants in the darunavir group developed resistance. Um, this outcome was similar across all subgroups between dolutegravir and darunavir. Um, it, uh, interestingly, groups, uh, the participants that had on baseline resistance testing, zero predicted active NRTIs at baseline actually had pretty good virologic response in both groups, so over 90% in both um, dolutegravir and darunavir groups. In terms of efficacy for the TDF versus idovidine, um, tenofovir was shown to have significantly higher rates of virologic suppression 
about 92% versus 84% was idovudine. This was maintained again across different viral load thresholds and sensitivity analyses. Viral rebound greater than 1,000 copies was also higher with cydovidine at 14% compared to only 5% in the tenofovir group. And of those seven participants that developed major dolutegravir resistance, five of them happened to be in the cydovidine group and only two of them were in the tenofovir group. So, um, here we go. So interestingly, uh, when they looked at baseline resistance testing in participants that had baseline K65Rs, which you would expect tenofovir to perform poorly, um, actually both groups had uh, performed very well with over 90% virologic suppression, um, and there was no um, disadvantage to continuing tenofovir in that uh, group. Um, when looking at subgroup analysis by baseline resistance, um, by different baseline resistance criteria, Overall, tenofovir looks like it's favored with um, certainly no subgroup suggesting that there's any advantage to the recommendation to switching to zidovidine that they could identify. So in conclusion, um, dolutegravir plus two NRTIs gives durable suppression in second line, um, even when NRTI has no predicted activity. This does support the WHO recommendation for dolutegravir use in second line therapy and supports the safety of programmatic switching to dolutegravir um, when pre-switch viral load and resistance testing may not be available. Um, the dolutegravir resistance was a concern, um, and the impact of this is uncertain. Um, authors recommended having a low threshold to implement additional counseling and adherence support to help mitigate this, and they also suggested that possibly utilizing tenofovir, continuation of tenofovir from the first line regimen may help decrease that risk. Um, boosted darunavir had equal efficacy to dolutegravir NRTI without risk of resistance, so it should be um, Authors stated it should be the preferred alternative to dolutegravir in second line therapy. Um, and finally, maintaining tenofovir 3TC was found to be superior um, at 96 weeks to switching to zidovidine 3TC um, on viral suppression, rebound, and possibly resistance. Does anyone know why they preferred dolutegravir over darunavir, given that they were equivalent and the dolutegravir group had more resistance? Is that just because of cost and convenience to patients or uh, pill combinations? That's a great question. I actually don't know. I don't know if anyone in the audience does. Like why the WHO made that change. I, I thought because it had to do with cost and this was sort of just a huge sweeping change that was being made. Yeah, that yeah. and I, I don't, you know, I think that it comes in a fixed dose combination as TLD, right? Might be another oh. reason. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so finally, we'll review um, some post hoc analysis of the SALSA study. So, just as a reminder, SALSA was a multi center randomized open label non inferiority phase three study um, in well controlled participants. So, it was a switch study um, who were on any three drug regimens with, with an um, NRTI backbone plus INSTI and an RTI or PI. Um, they had, no, had to have no prior virologic failure, no documented NRTI or INSTI resistance. Um, the participants were randomized to either continue their current three drug regimen or switch to dolutegravir 3TC. Um, this study was a post hoc analysis looking at um, proviral resistance testing that was conducted at time of switch on um, all participants to see if any baseline resistance um, had an effect on virologic response. So 192 participants in the dolutegravir 3TC group and 185 participants in the three drug regimen um, had proviral DNA for um, investigation. Uh, the average time from initial antiretroviral regimen to time of randomization was about uh, five years. Um, so at randomization was when that testing happened, uh, but there's a huge range as listed here. Um, so all of the baseline resistance mutations are listed here. I highlighted for um, NRTIs, about eight to 9% of participants in each group had major NRTI resistance, notably um, with regards to you know, 3TC activity. Uh, there were only five participants in the dolutegravir 3TC group who had the M184V mutation and four participants in the three drug regimen. Um, P major PI resistance mutations are listed here as well as NNRTI. Um, and then in terms of major resi INSTI resistance, there really wasn't much. There was one participant with a Y143H in the dolutegravir 3 tc group. Um, and then there was some uh, minor INSTI mutations as well. 
So in terms of outcomes, so overall, um, there's about 80, uh, there was equal virologic suppression between the two groups um, above 80%. Uh, when you look at participants that had any major NRTI resistance, um, virologic suppression was actually pretty good, 87% in the Dalyutegravir 3TC group and 69% in the three drug regimen group. Um, specifically looking at the M184V slash I mutations, 80% um, of participants, so four out of five in the Dalyutegravir 3TC group uh, maintained suppression and 50% uh, in the three drug regimen maintained suppression. So very low numbers, but reassuring to see that. Um, in terms of the participants with major INSTE resistance, the one participant had virologic suppression um, in the Dalyutegravir 3TC group and all of the participants um, in the three drive ART also suppressed. So authors concluded that, um, oh, and I forgot to mention they used stringent viral load, viral suppression criteria. So they had to be less than 40 copies or undetectable to meet these criteria. Um, so using that stringent criteria, um, the proportion of patients with baseline archive resistance who responded at week 48 was similar with switching to dalyutegravir 3 tc versus continuing the three-drug regimen. This remained similar in the 3% of patients in each arm with baseline archived M184V slash I resistance mutations. Um, so investigators concluded that these data do support the use of dalyutegravir 3 tc as a switch strategy in patients with virologic suppression and no documented prior dalyutegravir 3 tc resistance. Any questions about the switch studies? All right. Well, um, that's everything. So just to quickly kind of summarize everything we ran through very quickly, um, in terms of the triple BNAB cocktail, um, there was good virologic response initially uh, with a mean viral decrease of two logs. Um, selection of partially or completely resistant viral variants occurred despite high plasma BNAB levels. Um, but rebound viruses did maintain susceptibility to VRCO7523 LS. In the long acting dual BNAB cocktail, viral suppression did occur as well with a mean log reduction of 1.7 um, with prolonged half lives. And baseline sensitivity to both BNABs did show longer antiviral responses. In terms of long acting injectables, so for the Capella trial in high. So, so Shannon, can I just interrupt for a second? So, what's yeah. your conclusion on the BNABs then? What do you think? Well, so Where do you think we go from here. It's interesting. There was a lot of really good discussion with BNABs. Um, uh, a lot of there's a lot of hypothesis generate. This is is very hypothesis generating, I guess I would say. Um, you know, the question of whether we should now be kind of moving forward with susceptibility based regimens. Um, you know, was kind of. Uh, Controversial, um, authors did say in other studies in participants that were suppressed and uh, were switching to BNABs, baseline susceptibility testing did not correlate with virologic response very well. You know, the question of do we need to increase our doses? So is in vitro IC80 predictions of how much BNAB we need in the system actually going to be adequate to suppress people, particularly with higher viral loads because of consumption? You know, maybe we just need to that was kind of the theory of why participants with lower viral loads had better and longer responses potentially in these studies. So um, it's not entirely clear to me what, where, where we'll go from here with BNABs, but I think there's a lot of potential questions still kind of looming. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. I just, oh, no problem. <laughs> Um, in terms of long acting injectables, so for the Capella study and highly treatment experienced participants, um, Len, did, Len in combination with OBR did lead to high rates of virologic suppression. Um, resistance was seen, um, but that was with no active drugs in the OBR or suboptimal adherence to the oral components. Um, in the Calibrate study with treatment naive individuals, they also saw high rates of virologic suppression through one year, so that's exciting. Um, there were two participants with resistance, but there was um, suggestions of non-adherence to the FTAF component. Um, and then in Atlas 2M and virologically suppressed participants, Q8 weeks was uh, non-inferior to Q4 weeks at the three-year mark with high rates of virologic suppression. Um, confirmed virologic failure was higher in the Q8 week arm versus Q4 week and patient satisfaction scores were higher in the Q8 week arm. Um, in the VSEN study in suppressed participants on NNRTI, TAFED was non-inferior to TLD. In participants failing in an RTI, TAFED was also uh, non-inferior to TLD, and they were superior to the combined PI base regimens. In 2SD, 
participants who were suppressed on second line PI therapy, uh, dolutegravir was not inferior to continuing uh, their uh, current PI. In the Nadia trial, fan participants who were to uh, changing to zidovidine. And then in SALSA, uh, participants who were suppressed on a three-drug regimen, those who had baseline resistance, who were switched to dolutegravir 3 gc had similar proportion of responses at 48 weeks versus continuing three-drug ART. Um, this did remain similar in the very small subset of participants in each arm with baseline m 184 ve resistance mutations. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Slide credit to CCO and thanks to um, these two munchkins for leaving me alone while I was working on this and inspiring me by playing Encanto on repeat in my house. <laughs> and now hopefully if you haven't seen Encanto yet, you should. It's actually very good. <laughs> well done, Shannon. I and I love the weaving of Encanto in. <laughs> very, very clever. Um, I know that was a lot. Any any additional questions or discussion points from anybody? <laughs> um, I had one. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Great talk. Um, fun as well. Um, I, I might have missed this. I apologize. But was there, um, did the, the Atlas study, the Cabanuva um, uh, 152 week outcomes. Did they comment on weight gain or examine that? Uh, and if not, you know, is this something that's being looked at in the real world setting? Do we know any findings um, thus far? Um, that is a great question. They did not report it in this presentation. And I'd have to look back at some of the prior presentations um, at earlier time points to see um, what they reported for weight gain. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that was the question. So, so no worries. Um, the, uh, I'm, sure know, they just, did. I'm sure they have some I never some know. Point, but... I don't know if others have thoughts. I never know, you know, kind of what to tell people. We know about weight gain with the pretty much all the integrase inhibitors. And, you know, is, is this something we're seeing too? Is this a solution for people or, or not? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Robert, they reported the weight gain data from both Atlas and Flare um, at 48 week time points. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, because because the one was a switch study in people who were suppressed, and then right. the other was right uh, treatment naive who got suppressed on on Triamec and then switch. So um, the forty eight week weight gain data and those that were naive was um, almost identical to those people that went on Triamec and stayed on Triamec. So it was like one and a half kilos at forty eight weeks, and then the people that switched to it who were already suppressed. Those that were switched essentially had no, no weight gain. And then uh, those that stayed on their oral had no weight gain. And then those that were switched, it was again like one and a half kilo weight gain uh, at 48 weeks. So, um, um, but the, the thing about the switch is a lot of those people switched off of TDF based regimen. Right. So, um, right. so you're taking away the weight suppressive effect of TDF. And, and right. that's about the usual weight gain you see with, with removing TDF is about one and a half kilos or so. So, right. um, so yeah, so that might be why. And then I haven't seen any weight data in comparing Q8 week to Q4 week. week. Yeah, hopefully they'll present that at some point. <laughs> or share that with us at some point. Thank you, Lucas. Mm -hmm. Let me talk a little, oh, sorry, Dr. Lee. No, I didn't have anything. Sorry. <laughs> I saw your green light come on. I was I was going to ask if if uh, first of all, thank you, great presentation, and um, yes, Encanto is great. We've been <laughs> songs in my house like constantly the whole family for the last couple of months. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more um, about the uh, the um, dolutegravir three TC data that you presented at the end. Lucas and I were chatting about this via email recently yesterday, I think, um, and just really thinking about both this and then the Nadia study, they're both basically saying that monotherapy dolutegravir or monotherapy darunavir works just fine. <laughs> um, and I actually had a patient who would only just take dolutegravir despite my pleading, and he remained undetectable. So it, it is, I mean, that's basically what both of those seem to be showing us, especially the Nadia data where it was like, oh, is 3TC or FT or um, 
or AZT better, but actually it was just that 90% of people who expected to have no activity still suppressed on either darunavir or, or dolutegravir. So I feel like that's kind of the take home point from some of this um, and is making me try to think about the use of dolutegravir 3TC and how much I need to worry about these M184V people and, and how durable is that? Like, is that gonna be good for five or 10 years or is one little error gonna cause them to break through? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all great points. Um, I was really um, impressed with the Nadia data, you know, and that also with boosted PI, same same thing, right? Very high rates of suppression. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm sure that NRTIs involved are doing something. And if you have 3TC or FTC, you're selecting, you know, potentially selecting for a, a less fit strain of the virus. So um, I would argue you would still, I would still keep them there, <laughs> even if they're quote unquote doing nothing. Um, you know, I think there was a small study with dolutegravir monotherapy in Europe, like a proof of concept and with like 10 patients. And there were certainly failures with lots of yeah. uh, in steroids. Shannon, I thought uh, there was more than just one study. I thought okay. there were several monotherapy studies like in the 2012s, 13, 14, yeah. that were just failure after failure. I could be, I don't like, I just remember this being explored. It was obviously never with dolutegravir. But there was a dolutegravir. Yeah, I there was a dolutegravir one. Yeah, there, there was, was a monotherapy. Yeah, because <laughs> I remember paying attention to like, and I do think it's a fitness issue. I do think yeah. that, yeah, you know, and I, I think we should keep using them both. But and and there was, you know, it was small, and they, they, you know, some number of people suppressed, but but not right. enough. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I, and this I think is, you'd have you to, know, this is a well-controlled clinical trial, perfectly selected patient right. population. Um, you know, but Nadia, well, actually their, their participants had very, very high rates of, you know, adherence to study visits. And so, you know, also had very good support. So, you know, I think that's something to keep in mind too, in the real world setting. Um, I'm very biased. Yeah, I don't think that hospitalized people that are but I Most don't think risky, the take home but... <laughs> is, is monotherapy. We should be doing it. Right. I think we should be not scared of it if it, if a patient, is, it, you know, in your situation, but I, I certainly don't think we should be all exploring. Let's just put you on Dalutegravir. At least that's, you know, my impression over the many years. And, and Ryan added that there've been multiple studies looking at this, um, yeah, I, I, I do think there's a fitness uh, issue. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, Every, okay, if, lots if of I, people talk about. If I can add to, I agree with Shannon that, you know, these predictions of no activity are based off of these algorithms that are, like she said, I think that the NRTIs probably still, at least tenofovir, still have activity in a lot of those situations. But um, I also was thinking a lot about Nadia because of, these decisions always about how much we should do when people have TAMs. Um, and, uh, you know, I think too, that this is done in a resource limited setting where, you know, you don't have the same options that we have um, to create these nice robust regimens that are well tolerated with low pill burden. So, um, because, you know, there still were failures with dolutegravir resistance. So, um, you know, I think that's still, it's, it, it, it's just, it's, it's a different setting than, than the options that we have. Yeah, it's interesting. We've always kind of talked about, you know, if patients have a K65R, would TAF kind of, you know, due to higher intracellular concentrations, will that kind of overcome some of that? And there may actually be more activity than you'd expect with TDF. Um, but this study was with TDF and they had great results. So it's even more reassuring that, you know, in a lot of the patients were using TAF, um, we may also have kind of the benefit there of higher um, concentrations as well. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, Lucas. It's a little bit more reassuring in terms of when we're considering how many active agents to add to the regimen, um, that at least in, in, in patients that are now committed and are, are really good with their adherence, you know, maybe we can um, walk that back a little bit, you know, based on risk benefit of the adverse effect profiles of whatever drugs we're considering for sure. I think Nettie makes a really good point here, particularly for the population that she sees. So the, you know, the TAF waking issue uh, in uh, women and, you know, Latinx populations that she's using more dolutegravy 3 tc um, So at least that, you know, maybe that data is reassuring because I think there still is some trepidation. And, and certainly I think we don't 
uh, at least from my experience at, at our clinic, we don't use a ton of two drugs. Um, we seem to still fall on the other one, but it's, it's, I think it's great to see this. Um, yeah, and that and then, you know, and it was a switch study. So if they've proven that they can get themselves suppressed, you know, even if they do have an M184V, you know, maybe it is reasonable to consider, you know, the work of the regimen is, is only just to kind of keep them suppressed, not get them suppressed. Um, at least from that salsa data, that was just switch data, not um, viremic patients. So, yeah. And then Connie just made a comment about um, some, uh, some, some studies with uh, lopinavir and ritonavir in resource limited settings where people did well for a fair amount of time. And that may be the point, right? They can do well for some period of time, but then, you know, what happens in the, in the long term? I'll let you have the final word though, Shannon. Um, <laughs> anything else? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm surprised nobody brought up um, the lenacapavir uh, treatment naive study, the fat, the kind of um, discordance between um, subcutaneous, between routes of administration, right? So subcutaneous Q six months versus oral uh, for the backbone. Um, you know, authors, there was a lot of questions about that um, at Croy in the discussion, just about, you know, feasibility and risk of resistance if you've kind of got this discordant regimen. Um, so they kind of reinforced that, you know, it was a kind of proof of concept type of study. They most likely won't take those exact regimens to phase three, um, but they didn't exactly say what the plan is in terms of, you know, naive individuals moving forward now, what are they going to do for lenacapavir regimens? Um, but, you know, TAF and Bictegravir do have the possibility of long acting um, options in the future. So that was speculation. That was why they kind of chose those um, for the two study arms. So it'll be really interesting to see what comes um, in the future. And hopefully the holds, all the holds will be lifted and we can keep yeah. moving forward. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Shannon, thank you so much. This was really a fabulous talk. I, I don't know the number of slides you ultimately got down to, but you proved me wrong if, if this really was 90 slides. No. Um, I think it was like um, 60. <laughs> still, still more than I would ever recommend. So you, you did wonderfully. It really was you know, very comprehensive and a nice overview of, of some really key slides uh, or some key studies from Croy. So greatly appreciated. And Welcome bravissimo, to the club. Bravissimo, Shannon, bravissimo. Yeah. Thank you, Lalo. Thank you, can you see my? Can you see the club that you're going to oh, be part of? No, Sorry, no. it's not. I had someone walking around in the oh, background. Yeah. I, did so I, water I, I did it for the water bottle. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to yell that at people every time they're a, a newly minted high round speaker. So anyway, this really was great. Thanks. Um, next week. Oh, I always mean to do this. Um, Marvin, are you on? And can you remind us of who is speaking next week? Or is it a, no, it's not a holiday. Yes, next week. Next week we have Dr. Benson. Oh, it's Dr. Benson next week. Oh, sorry, Benson. next week we're off. No. Never mind, sorry. The next week is Cesar Chavez Day, so we're off. It is Cesar Chavez, okay. Sorry, okay. the following April 1st, we have um, Dr. Thanks. Benson. He just gave me a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, I was I'm like, sorry. wait, <laughs> really? I thought she was in April. Okay, yeah. yeah, we're off Ooh. next week. All right, well, so, yes, yeah, so we'll see everyone back in two weeks for our final Croy review topic with Dr. Benson. Um, thanks, everyone. And again, great job, Shannon. Have a good week, uh, Friday and weekend. <laughs>